Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and we're going to be doing a two-parter on the channel for a product that just came in the other day. This is the new Synology DS109 Plus. This is a network attached storage device with five drive bays on it. And what I thought I would do in this video is set it up and show you what all the steps are to get everything working because you do have some choices to make when you're configuring one of these things. And then in the next video, we'll review the unit itself and talk about why you might want to go with the more expensive mid-range model like this one versus some of their lower cost entry level devices. So we've got plenty to do on this one and we're going to unbox it and get it set up in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this is on loan from Synology. So when we're done with this, it goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. I should also mention that we do occasionally have sponsored videos from Synology on the channel as well. Uh, this video, however, is not sponsored. So let's get into it now. Let's unbox it and get it going. All right, so let's get this thing out of the box here. I don't have a price on this one yet. I think it's going to be under $800 diskless. Uh, so you do have to get your own drives to uh, go along with the rest of the device here. This is the power uh, cord, by the way. Um, but one of the things you can do with one of these multi-bay Synology drives is start off small and kind of work your way up. Here's the quick installation guide. Um, so if you don't want to purchase five drives right away, you can buy two of them and then add more as you need to do that. Uh, there are some decisions you can make to make that expansion simple. Uh, and we'll explore some of those options in a minute. So we've got a bunch of cardboard in here. Let's move all those things out of the way. And here is the unit itself. Now this is powered by an Intel processor. I think it's a Celeron. Uh, and it's very similar to some of the mini PCs that we've looked at. Uh, the chip on this particular model is uh, going to support the uh, Intel Quick Sync feature. So it should work very well for uh, working as a Plex server in addition to a number of other things as well. So we'll explore all of that. So let's get it out of the box here. Now this particular model comes with eight gigs of RAM, which will give us a lot of different things we can try when we go to do our full review. And I'm eager to play with some of those more advanced features than what my current device can accept. And then that's it. We've got it out of the box here and now we have to start installing some hard drives. Uh, it's very easy to install drives on this. You just pop out uh, these little trays here. Now the first decision you have to make is what drives do you get with it? Now what Synology sent over to me were a bunch of these Toshiba drives. Uh, these drives are designed specifically for network attached storage and all of the major drive manufacturers have some kind of NAS drive. And the reason why you might want to go with a NAS drive which costs a little bit more uh, versus a more traditional hard drive is that uh, these are designed to run 24 7. They often come with better warranties. So if your data is very important to you, then I suggest spending a little bit extra on the nicer drive to make sure your data is going to be intact all the time. These drives do last longer. I've had very good experiences with NAS drives over the years. In fact, I got a bunch of them in one of my other devices that have been running now for four years and they're still fine. I may do a, a drive replacement strategy on that soon, and that might be a fun video to talk about as well. Now, these things are designed to accept the drives without any tools. Uh, so what I'm gonna do here is just pop off these two rails, and we're going to uh, place the drive in, oops, like this, and uh, make sure the screw holes here kind of align, and it looks like we're good to go there. And all you have to do is just snap back in these little plastic things here, and that will secure the drive uh, in its tray. Again, you just want to make sure it's lined up with the uh, screws on the side of the drive here. And then what we're going to do is repeat this process times five. And to spare you the agony of watching this, what I'm going to do is uh, get all these drives out of the boxes and installed, and then I'll show you what we do next. All right, so we got our last drive ready to go here. We're just going to slide it into the bay here and close the door. So now we've got five four terabyte hard drives installed. But we are not yet done because this device has another feature called SSD caching. Uh, there are some numbers here printed above each of these slots. We have one and two. And this will accept NVMe solid state drives that look like this. It will not work, I believe, with uh, M2 SATA drives. So you're going to want to look for an M.2 NVMe PCI Express drive. Now, I'm only going to put in one of these. And this will impact a decision we'll be making a little bit later when we get things configured. 
Now, what the solid state drives do on one of these NAS boxes is that they act as a cache for frequently accessed files. This is not going to improve media watching or encoding or anything like that, but if you are storing a lot of uh, spreadsheets or Word documents, or maybe you've got a bunch of photos that are frequently accessed, what the NAS is going to do is continually monitor usage, and the files that it sees you're accessing the most over the network, it's going to copy them over to the cache so that they're more quickly available for requests. Because one thing when you've got uh, five spinning hard drives here is that it doesn't always uh, find the data you're looking for very quickly. Uh, so having one of these uh, solid state drives in place is a way to speed that up a bit. And there's a couple of different ways you can use this. Uh, now in keeping with their toolless installation here, we just have to snap back this little piece of plastic to put it in place. And now we are all set there, so we're going to uh, put that back together. All right, so our storage is installed on here. And remember, you don't have to use all five bays to start. If you want to start on the cheap, get two drives and then upgrade down the road. But if you do put all five in, you do have a lot more options for how you want to configure the storage. Now, the next step, now that all the storage is ready to go, is to get the network connected. Now, this particular model has two one gigabit uh, Ethernet jacks on the back. There's a bunch of different ways you can make use of the available network resources you have with this. Uh, some of the other higher end Synology boxes support the 10 gigabit standard, which allows for faster speed, provided the computers you're connecting with also have 10 gigabit adapters. I do think for most uh, small offices and home environments, you probably just need uh, that single gigabit Ethernet connection here, and all you have to do is just plug your Ethernet in and you're off and running. Uh, they don't have Wi-Fi typically built into these boxes. I don't recommend Wi-Fi for network attached storage, just given uh, the amount of resources it takes to operate. Uh, but you can install a Wi-Fi adapter with uh, USB here on one of the USB ports if you really have to use Wi-Fi and you have no other solution. So what I'm going to do now is get this thing plugged in, and then we'll begin stepping through the software configuration. So the NAS is now powered up. When you first turn it on, you're going to see the power light here blink for a bit. It will then beep and go solid. And it might be hard to see on camera right now, but the status light here is blinking, which indicates that we are not yet installed, although we are booted up. And the best way to find your Synology NAS on the network when you first plug it in is to go on your web browser and go to find.synology.com. And what you should see when you go to this website is your particular NAS device here waiting to be set up. So here we've got our DS1019+. Plus. We have the local IP address, and then we also see that it is not installed. Uh, one thing you might want to do after you get everything set up is set a static IP for your local network address for the Synology NAS so you can more easily find it. But as you'll see, a lot of modern PCs and other devices will just find it automatically no matter what its local IP address is. We're going to click Connect now, and that's going to bring us to all of our uh, EULA stuff here, which we'll agree to to get going. And one of the nice things I like about uh, the Synology interface is that it's got a really nice web interface that's very easy to understand, uh, even though you've got a lot of open source software running underneath that isn't always the easiest to figure out. So the first step here is to install the disk manager software, which we're going to do right now. We're going to click install. And what it's going to also remind us about here is that uh, the data on our five hard drives is going to be removed. So if you have taken drives out of another device and put them in here, they will, of course, get erased. Now, there are some ways you can uh, migrate from one Synology device to another. I did a video about that a couple of years ago. Uh, so if you do have a, a set of drives from another Synology NAS and it supports that migration, you'll see something different here. But any other kind of drive is just going to get wiped out. Uh, which is what's going to happen right now. And this process will take a little bit, probably about 10 minutes it says. It's going to be downloading that software, formatting the drives, and getting uh, everything set up for our next step. So we're going to let this run, and when it's done, we'll come back and do more configuration. So now everything has been downloaded and installed, and now we are being asked our first configuration question, which is what do we want the server to be called? And I'm going to call this DS1019, just so I know which one it is on my network. I'm going to set up a username and a password here, and then we'll move on from there. Now, it's telling me my password is weak. 
Uh, so you might want to experiment with a couple different password options to get a stronger password, especially if you want to make the uh, drive here accessible uh, on the internet. And uh, you can go through and play around with a few different password options. There are ways to enable two-factor authentication on this as well, which you might want to do. Uh, we did a video on two-factor authentication that you might want to check out. And then we'll move to the next option here. Um, so now it's asking us about our DSM update and maintenance. Now this is going to be the first of many choices we have to make here. Now you can always change your mind later. Uh, what I recommend for most people is you have it install the latest version automatically, and then you can set an installation schedule. We're just going to go with Sundays and Wednesdays. Uh, right here it's saying uh, 6.05 a.m., but if you are uh, you know, a busy work environment, you might want to set it for like 3 a.m. or something just so that uh, it doesn't interrupt your work day or your weekend playtime or whatever. And you will see updates getting installed quite frequently on these, and it's important to make sure those happen because this is uh, largely powered by open source software, and when there are vulnerabilities discovered, uh, they have been very good about patching those pretty quickly. So if you don't want to worry about that stuff and just have it maintained for you, uh, click that option and just let it go. Uh, the other cool thing is that uh, it doesn't seem like they stopped doing these because my Synology device that I use in my closet over there has been going for about four and a half years and it's still getting updates all the time. So it's really nice to just have that happen for you. Uh, if you are a more advanced user, you can of course manage this yourself, but I think for most folks, having it do it automatically is the way to go. We're gonna leave the other options intact here. Now here's our next decision, which is Quick Connect. So what this lets you do is set up uh, a, a Synology account, and Synology is not going to get your data, but what they're going to do is give you an address that you can use to access your Synology drive when you're on the internet someplace other than home. It's very convenient, uh, but there are some security considerations here because if somebody were to get your username and password and figure out uh, what your Synology Quick Connect ID is, uh, they could of course access your private data. My preference is to set up a VPN, which I did through my uh, router that I use, uh, so that I have to have a, a certificate, uh, a username and a password, and then I can get into my network and access the drive. It's a little bit more work to get in, but it is something that's a little bit better to work with. Uh, but if you are looking for just a very quick and easy way to uh, forward your domain over, you can create one of these quick uh, connect IDs to do that. If you don't want to do this, uh, hidden down here below the next option is skip this step uh, to move forward. And uh, this is what I would suggest you do. But again, if you want convenience, you can create a Quick Connect ID. And then when you load up one of your Synology apps, you can just type in that Quick Connect ID to quickly uh, get to your device over the internet. Okay, next it says we are all set and it's asking us to take a quick guided tour of DSM. Uh, there's also an option here to share your device's network location to make it easier for you to find it via find.synology.com. I'm going to leave that checked off because I like to have more control over these things, but if you uh, do want to very quickly find your drive, that's another way to be able to do that. And now we're going to move forward here. Uh, the next question is device analytics. If you want to provide some anonymized analytics to Synology, you can click yes here, uh, or you can say no thanks, and that will be it. So now what it's going to do is just kind of guide us through the basic interface of our Synology uh, disk station here. So you can see uh, where to find your applications and the package center, which I'm going to step through for you here in a second. And now it looks like we are in and ready to go. So our system health here is good and we are ready to start configuring things. And that will lead us to our biggest decision here, which is how to configure the five drives that we have installed on this device. And we're going to uh, step through that configuration now. What you want to do is go up here to the upper left hand corner, uh, push that, it's kind of like a little start menu, and then you want to go over to Storage Manager, and when we pull that up, you'll see here that we have five unused disks that we need to assign to something. So we're going to go over here to Volume, and you'll see there is no volume in your system. So we're going to create that volume right now. Now you have two options here, one is quick and one is custom. Uh, quick will create an SHR volume, uh, which is Synology's hybrid RAID. And they recommend this for folks who are just looking to get started quickly. It's not very hard to configure. Uh, this is probably the best way to go, in my opinion, if you only are starting out with two or three drives on here. 
uh, because what you can do later is just add more drives and it's a fairly simple process to begin expanding your storage. There are other options you can pursue that will let you do similar things, but SHR really is the easiest for getting started but you may not have all the control you might want if you're an advanced user. So I'm going to click on the custom option here first just to see what some of our options are and what they mean, but eventually we're going to go back and set up a quick option here for our volume. Now the first thing it's going to ask us is whether or not we want to create a storage pool. Uh, because we have no storage pool created, the only option is to create a new one. And then it's going to ask us if we want better performance or higher flexibility. Uh, basically, it's asking us if we want to create multiple pools on here that are managed on different drives or just have the entire set here be made into a single volume. I think it's better to go with that single option as the better performance uh, option here will let us do uh, just because it's simpler. So we're going to do that. Now, by default, it is asking us to create a RAID 5 array. It's kind of the uh, compromise position between performance and redundancy uh, and storage space. But the problem with RAID 5 is that it only supports one drive failing before you have an issue. So if one of these drives failed and then we lost another one, uh, our array is pretty much done for. Uh, so there are some options you can employ here to uh, be able to get more than one drive redundancy. And that would be going to something called RAID 6, which is an option here on the list. And you have to have a minimum of four drives to start with RAID 6, uh, but this would allow you to be able to lose two drives yet still have your data intact. Now the problem though is that when you go to something like RAID 6, you don't have as much storage available to you. Uh, so I'm going to run through some things here on Synology's RAID calculator to make this a little bit more visual. Uh, so what we have here are four, uh, five four terabyte drives like our device here has currently. And then we can select what kind of RAID types we want to go with. So you can see SHR and RAID 5 are very similar in that we would have 16 terabytes of available space, but essentially one of those drives or the space on one of those drives is reserved for redundancy so that if we lost the drive, we can still maintain our array. If we select RAID 6 here, uh, you'll notice that we have 12 terabytes available to use, but eight terabytes are used for protection Again, that's if we lose two drives here, we still have the ability to maintain the array with RAID 6. So this decision you're making here is very much uh, whether or not you need redundancy or the maximum amount of storage before you get started. And that is an important decision because it will impact how this thing is going to work uh, moving forward. What's important to note here is that there is an option called SHR2, which is essentially RAID 6 that uh, would give you the same breakdown in storage here. But I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, that SHR2 might be a little bit easier to expand the storage array later versus regular RAID 6. It gets really complicated based on how you have things configured and what size drives you put in. But in the interest of simplicity here and thinking potentially about the future, I'm going to go with SHR2 for this and hopefully you were able to figure out what you might need from this brief explanation of what your options would be for an array like this one. And we'll go back over to uh, our configuration screen, select quick and uh, create an SHR2 array. Now you'll see that the minimum number of disks we need here is four. If we went with regular SHR, we could actually start with one and then build it out as we go. But again, my preference here for this simulation uh, is having redundancy that would allow for two drive failures. So I'm going to click on next here. And you can see now it's selected all five disks. I could choose to only put it on four if I wanted to and maybe use the fifth as a spare or something, but I want as much storage as I can get out of this. So I'm going to click on next now. And now it's going to remind me that the drives will be erased and I'm okay with that. So I'm going to click continue. And now you've got another decision. Uh, you have two file systems you can choose from. Uh, one is BTRFS, which is what Synology recommends. And the other one is the uh, Linux uh, EXT4 standard file system. Now, one of the neat things about BTRFS is that it offers a few things for data redundancy in addition to the physical redundancy here we have with these drives. I did a video on BTRFS, which I'll put down below in the video description so you can check it out and see exactly what it does. 
Uh, but there are some things like snapshotting and other features that might help you recover a file that was changed even if you don't have a backup made. It's a really uh, neat way to go about things. Some people don't like BTRFS for a host of different reasons, so if you are not comfortable with it, uh, you can go to ext4, but I think, again, for our uh, simple installation here, BTRFS should work well for most uh, small office environments. So we're going to uh, click next here and get started, and then we're going to be given a confirmation screen about all the different things that we just set up here, and we should have about uh, 11 terabytes or so of storage available once everything is configured. There's a little bit of overhead, it looks like, for uh, the Synology system itself, which is why we don't have the full uh, 12 that we saw a little bit earlier. All right, so I think we're ready to get started now. I'm going to click Apply here to uh, build out the RAID array, and it will take just a few minutes to get ready to go on to our next step. And what you'll see here on the device is all the drives here blinking uh, because they are getting configured. Our status light is now a solid green, so we know that uh, we've made some progress here. And if you look on screen, what you'll get is a confirmation of what you asked for, uh, which is the Synology Hybrid RAID in this instance with data protection of two disk fault tolerance. And again, if you chose something different, you would see something different on that particular screen. Uh, we have the BTRFS file system. And you can see right now it's verifying hard disks in the background. Uh, for parity consistency. This takes a really long time when you first set up one of these things, so just be prepared to not get the full performance out of this initially. You might feel a little sluggishness uh, both on the network and just in doing things with it. Once it gets through with that parity check, it'll feel a lot better. So just be advised, if you see things running a little bit slowly, don't worry, it's just because it's doing this fault tolerance check and that's going to take it a little while to get going. All right, so now that we've got this RAID array going, that consistency check is happening in the background, we can now build out our file shares finally and make this device available to users of our network. So now let's go over to the control panel. If for some reason you don't see it right here, you can click here and then find it on your list of applications. And we'll just load that up real quick. And we're going to go over to the shared folder option. And we're going to click create. And I'm going to call this uh, LAN, just to be simple here. And we'll say that this is LAN's stuff. Keep out. And uh, we've got this on volume one. If we had multiple volumes on our array, we could choose which set of hard drives it will be stored on. Uh, you have the option to hide it from Windows computers if you want, but we want to make this thing available to our network users. So I'm going to click on Next here. Uh, you have the option to encrypt the shared folder if you want, and you can set that up uh, here. I did a video on this, I believe, a little while ago, so I'll link to that. Uh, but again, we're keeping things simple for this video just to get things set up and operating, and we can maybe go into some of these more advanced features a little later if you're interested. Uh, so we're going to click on Next here. Uh, there's an option to enable data checksum for advanced data integrity. And what we can do here is enable that, and that will enable some of the features of the BTRFS file system to ensure that we're not getting any file corruption. Just an added uh, piece of uh, mind here you can get for that. Uh, you can also, through BTRFS, have a shared folder quota. So if you want to limit how much stuff people can put into one of these things, you can enable that here as you're setting it up. You also have the option to compress files if you want to try to make them a little smaller for uh, saving space. But because we've got uh, well over 10 terabytes at the moment, I'm okay just leaving all that stuff off. Uh, we'll click on Next to move forward. And now we can see we've got our confirmation here. I'm going to click Apply. And that's going to now create our first uh, shared uh, directory here on the server. Now, the next option is to look at users and who has access to what. Now, you have a lot of options for setting up users on here and determining what those users can do. And you'll get this screen every time you create a new volume so you get them set up from the get-go. Uh, but what I'm going to do here is uh, kind of leave things as is because I'm going to create a user in a minute and show you how you can uh, restrict people from getting into things. So we're just going to click OK for now. And now this volume is created. We can actually get into our Synology disk station now and start putting files on it if we want. So let's go over to my Mac real quick. Uh, you can see that the DS1019 is showing up on the network. So it is uh, working and accessible to our computers. Uh, right now, it's not connected here on my Mac because we have this thing, of course, restricted by usernames and passwords. So on the Mac, I'm going to click on Connect, as you just saw there. I'm going to click Connect again. 
I'm going to type in my username and the password I set up. And when I do that, sure enough, there is the lawn folder. And I've got a couple of random images I think I'm going to just stick in there just to see how everything works. So let's do that real quick. We'll just drag those files over. And now those have copied over the network. And what I want to do now is just jump back to the Synology interface because one of the cool things you can do is actually use your web browser to browse around the device here. And as you can see, those images that I just sent up are uh, now accessible to us on the web interface. And then anyone else who had access to this file share here could also look at them. And they even have a nice little image browser uh, that works inside of uh, this web interface so you can look at some of the files on there. And again, I'm going to refer you back to uh, some of the prior videos I've done on the Synology series because there are some really cool features that you can uh, get at both for file searching and accessing files. There's even a text editor available to you. So you have a lot of things you can do uh, right here within the web interface. But this is basically how it works. We've got our file system set up. We can access it over the network and we have restricted it uh, at the moment just to me and the administrator user on here. So let's create another set of users and give them their own place to be in and away from my stuff. All right, so let's jump back to the control panel now. We've got two options up here for users. We've got users and groups. And what I'm gonna do actually is create a group for my kids called kids uh, so that we can more easily configure things moving forward. Now I can assign this group to a specific folder. If I don't want the group to access my stuff, I can click on no access here, but you also have the ability to give people read only access to a particular folder. So if you just wanna create files that people can look at, uh, you can restrict their ability to edit or change those files by clicking on read only. Uh, but again, I don't want them in my stuff. I'm gonna click uh, next here. We're gonna create a separate share for them in a minute. Now, some of these things are things that we're not going to worry about either, including the user quota setting uh, on that particular folder. We don't need to here because we're not giving them access to that. Uh, we're also going to not, at the moment, give them access to applications, but I'm going to show you uh, how you can install applications in a minute, and you can actually restrict what applications people can get access to when they log into the Synology disk station over uh, a web browser like we're doing now. So you have a lot of fine-tuning controls you can have here uh, by groups. You can also limit how fast they can access uh, certain features of the Synology disk station here, like the FTP and file station. You can actually slow down how fast their uploads go in if you want. And we're going to click on apply here just to create this group. And now what we'll do is we'll go over to users and create a couple of users that we can put in here. Uh, so we're gonna create one for my daughter, Kira. And we'll just uh, give her a fake email address here and we'll give her a password of dad rules, right? Uh, which is a very weak password that you shouldn't use, but it gives you an idea as to how this creation process goes. I'm gonna leave everything here as the uh, default. I'm going to click next here and I'm going to assign her to uh, the kids group now. And then you'll see very similar things to what we saw before because you can actually uh, override the group permission here. If I wanted her to have read-only access to my folder, even though she's in the kids group, we could do that here if we wanted to, but we're going to skip through all that. Again, we have application settings that could go beyond the group permissions. I will click next here, next again, and apply. And now that user is being created, and now we'll create one for the other kid. And then when we're done with this, we will set up a file share for them so that they can get access to some files. All right, so we are now back on the uh, control panel screen. We're going to go to shared folder. We've got the volume I created for me. I'm going to create now another shared folder for them, and we'll call this kids folder. And we'll just say for the kids only. And we'll go ahead and just complete the process we did a little bit earlier. We'll put that checksum on there, why not? Uh, and I could even go back to this quota thing and say, you know what, I want to limit the kids to three gigabytes and no more. Uh, and that will limit the actual share uh, folder size here. And I'll click apply and that'll create the folder and that'll be available now on the network. Now the next step here is to assign access to this. Now I have two kids and for the sake of efficiency, I can select groups here and say that kids can have read and write access to the folder. You can also see that the administrators have read and write access so I can get in there. Uh, we'll click OK here and that will get things going. So now what we should be able to do uh, is head over to this little Windows tablet that maybe my daughter Kira is using and let's see what she can get access to. Okay, so let's go and pull up the Windows Explorer icon here. 
Now what you want to look for is the network option here on the uh, lower left hand portion of the screen and you can see the DS1019 is showing up there. One thing on Windows that confuses people often is that you'll, you might see the device in more than one place. So for example, under other devices here, we're seeing it show up. But if you click on this, you're not going to get access to the file system. So you want to look for uh, what Windows calls computer. And you can see here we have the DS1019 there. So I'm going to click on this. And what will happen more than likely, hopefully, uh, is that we will be asked to enter in a username and a password. Uh, so I'm going to type in Kira and our password of dad rules and I'll click OK. And now what will happen here is we'll be able to see the files that Kira has access to. So let's give this tablet a second here to catch up and get authenticated. Uh, and then once that process is done, we should see what files we can get at here. So let's let this thing do whatever it's doing and we'll come right back. Okay, so now we can see that we have the kids folder, which she should have access to. And it's also showing the lawn folder that she doesn't have access to. Uh, so if I try to click on lawn here, you can see now it's asking for more credentials because access is denied. Uh, so we can't get into that, but we can get into the kids folder here. And just like before, we can drag some files in and uh, copy them over to the Synology disk station if we wish, and that file just went in there. And then what I could do maybe is go back on my uh, Mac here, which is logged into the Synology's web-based control panel, and if I go into here, I can see that the picture that Kira just copied over is in here. So you can see how you can limit access to things, how I can have access to something that my kids are using, but they can't access things that I want. And again, you can spend a lot of time in here getting everything uh, configured out the way that you want. And that's one of the nice things about the complexity sometimes that these systems offer is that you have the ability really to finely tune who can do what and when and, and how. So it's a really robust system. Now we've got one more thing to configure on here, which is the SSD cache. Now remember, we put in that NVMe drive on the bottom of the unit when we were setting it up. Now it is time to configure it. Uh, now that we have some files on our new file system here, and we're going to go to the start menu and we're going to go back to the storage manager. And what we're going to see here on the storage manager is an option for SSD cache. And I'm installing some software on here too, so we might see this uh, disappear for a second, so bear with me. Uh, what we're going to do is go over to create, and when we do that, we're going to be given an option for what mode we want. Now you'll see right now that read-write cache is disabled, and the reason is that we only installed a single SSD on here. In order to have read-write caching work, you need two for redundancy. It almost sets up a mini RAID between those two drives because if you are doing the read-write cache and you've got data on the SSD and it fails, you could have some data loss as a result. Uh, so the safest option is to do the read-only cache, which will improve consumption of files on the network like photos and documents and whatnot, uh, but you don't have any risks to data by doing uh, the read-write. Again, though, if we had two SSDs in there and you're doing a lot of reading and writing to those small files, uh, this might definitely improve performance. But for this example, uh, because we have a single uh, SSD installed, we're going to do the read-only option. Uh, it found the drive that we have installed on the bottom there, the uh, Force MP300. I'm going to click Next here, and we're going to just allocate all the size that it needs and click Apply. It's also going to remind us it's going to uh, basically erase the SSD, so that's fine. And we'll let that uh, process. And once that's done, we have our cache set up. And what will happen here, it's going to mount it, and then uh, as we start using the Synology NAS, we'll actually be able to get some analytics as to how many files are on there and uh, what kind of efficiencies we're gaining by caching some of that stuff to the SSD. So you can go in there and look at it every once in a while to see what happens. They also have a cache advisor here that will take a look at your current file usage and make some recommendations as to what kind of cache you might need if you are adding this later. You don't have to do it right away like we're doing now. Uh, so what it'll do is it'll take a look at what's being accessed on your device here and after it does a short analysis it'll make some recommendations as to how big your SSD cache needs to be in order to be functional. Let it process here and I'll show you what it looks like when it finishes up that. Okay so the analysis is complete and you can see it's giving us a recommendation of a cache of at least 458 megabytes to access all the hot files that 
uh, it has accessed so far. And this is kind of uh, a little bit inaccurate at the moment because we just set up this device, so we're really not sure exactly which files are going to be read more than others, but this gives you an idea as to how it works. And of course, over time, the files that fall into the warm, hot, or cold categories will adjust based on how users are accessing the files on the device. Now, we're not going to spend too much time in Package Center, uh, but this is something where you'll probably spend many hours playing around with all the different applications that they give you access to. There are many, many, many applications and servers that you can install. Uh, the one I suggest you start with, though, uh, is the Hyper Backup System, which you can find right here. Uh, I did a whole video on this. In fact, I think I did two videos on Hyper Backup. Uh, it is very robust. It gives you the option to back up to USB hard drives. You can do uh, local network backups. You can then also send your backups off to cloud services. That's something that I do too here in the uh, studio just to keep my YouTube videos backed up safely somewhere off site. And I think it's really important to spend time getting your backup set up before you really do too much more with this because Although you've got that redundancy on here, uh, should an asteroid hit your house, you're kind of out of luck. So you really want to make sure you've got uh, the files on here uh, copied and sent somewhere, even if it means using an external hard drive that you uh, shuttle back and forth to an outside location, because you can't stop physical damage from happening to your home or office, and it's important to uh, just keep those things in mind. You could even have somebody walk off with this thing. Uh, they have Kensington lock options to prevent that, but again, it's something that is vulnerable, and you've got a lot of data now in one little spot that I think you want to uh, make sure you protect. Uh, there is a ton of other stuff that we're going to talk about in the next video. Uh, the focus of the next video will be some of the things that you can do with a more high-end device like this one, or at least a mid-range device. And that includes things like Synology's Office Suite that allows you to edit documents and spreadsheets and everything, including multiple users accessing those same documents simultaneously through a web browser, uh, just like you can do with a major service, but it's all contained in the box that you own and control in your office. There, of course, are no uh, charges for the 10 terabytes of storage we'll have access to on here. Uh, because we own it and it's really cool to have that ability to do that and it's really pretty simple to get everything up and running. So we're going to be uh, stopping this video now because we've got this thing set up and running and what we'll do in the next one again is look at some of the unique features that you'll get when you spend a little bit more for your Synology NAS. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast. Tom Albrecht. Anuj Zaveri. And Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.